All right, well, uh, with now for the main event, um, we're gonna introduce, so Alan Cobb is one of our master gardeners. Not only is he one of our master gardeners, he's one of our brand new master gardeners, um, but he is fantastic. Um, he's been an enormous help, um, enthusiastic about our new native plant landscape that is a huge undertaking that we're installing at the extension office that hopefully, I mean, feel free to drop by now, but hopefully it'll really be a sight to see and a cool place to visit very shortly within a year or so. Um, so I am going to let Alan start sharing whenever you're ready. Let's make sure it works. All right. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lori. That was a really great uh, introduction, honestly, to this talk. Um, you know, I'm going to touch on uh, rain gardens in a little bit, and that'll be a great kind of segue. Let me just get this shared. Okay, so um, once again, uh, Laura and Joanna, thank you so much for uh, considering me to give this this talk. Um, you know, native landscaping is something that I've honestly been doing my entire life. Um, I got into horticulture really because of my passion for wildlife, and I learned pretty early on that if you build the habitat, you know, the the animals and the um, uh, everything will just kind of fall into place and come around you. So. Um, you know, this is a uh, really near and dear to my heart. And it's uh, really something I think that, you know, obviously we have a lot of enthusiasm around this topic um, these days and uh, just really excited to be a part of this. So um, I grew up in Cobb County, saw a lot of people from Cobb County uh, on the call tonight. And that's really exciting. Uh, lived in Athens about seven years now, but uh, born and raised in the Piedmont region. Um, I studied uh, wildlife management in the Warren L School of Forestry. Uh, but I've been doing landscaping professionally since uh, my senior year of high school, so about 2001. Um, lived in Miami for a few years and uh, got my first kind of break into the industry as a horticulturist at the Miami Beach Botanical Garden. So it's a little bit different from um, what we, our climate here, obviously Miami is, is truly, truly tropical, rarely dips down into the low 40s. So, um, but it was really interesting to kind of see the uh, difference between the two uh, environments. Um, you know, you really can't grow things like dogwoods or um, azaleas or really even crepe myrtles um, down there. So it was kind of interesting to see the transition. Um, I currently work for uh, several companies, but uh, servescape.net is a new startup that started in uh, March of this year. And I'm uh, one of the lead hort horticulturists and uh, responsible for sourcing a lot of the plant material. And then um, I have a company, Native Horticulture Design, that um, I do installations uh, just like rain gardens, uh, pollinator gardens, and, and uh, things that we're going to touch on tonight. So, um, you know, traditional landscape design is really um, kind of showing the prowess of human superiority. And I don't say that in a condescending way, but this is really, you know, what... Um, traditionally landscaping has been all about is taming nature and really um, you know reining it in and so you know you see this over and over again and it, and it's not ugly I mean don't get me wrong these are certainly you know magnificent uh, incredibly detailed designs but um, you know what Laurie was touching on earlier you know these take tremendous amount of resources to maintain I mean you see you see all these lawn all these uh, green shrubs that have to be maintained um, constantly, you know, to keep the, you know, not to mention the labor hours to do the pruning, but the water that goes in and the fertilizer, the fertilizer that goes in that ultimately gets washed off, you know, and, and becomes runoff in our uh, aquifer. So, you know, these designs, although they demonstrate how um, artistic and how, you uh, really sophisticated, we can manage our landscapes, um, it really doesn't do much for conservation efforts. Um, this is actually a photograph I took in uh, my first trip to Peru. Uh, my wife is actually from Peru. So, you know, we uh, do take trips there occasionally. And this is in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. And you see how clear and, and just, uh, you know, bald essentially this landscape is. And it's because they're afraid of of the wildlife. They're eliminating the ability of the wildlife to be near their homes. And they have good reasons. I mean, they have very venomous, deadly vipers, uh, you know, huge tarantulas, um, you know, army ants, waves of army ants that come through. So there is a purpose here for them. But 
we have sort of a different situation um, here. You know, we're really in these suburban and urban areas um, and the, the concrete jungle really has become uh, more and more prevalent with, with urban sprawl. So uh, you do see a lot of designs uh, keeping up with the Joneses is sort of a, a thing I like to say because I do have a lot of clients that um, will tell me, well, you know, I saw my neighbor had this and I want that too. And so it, it does become a little bit of a um, infection in a way that you, you look across and see a bright, beautiful green lawn and, and it is beautiful and you want that too. And you want to demonstrate that you have the ability to keep that as well. Um, and it does take a lot of resources. It takes a lot of money to install. It takes a tremendous amount of money to maintain, um, not just water, but chemicals um, and not just fertilizer, but a lot of herbicides, a lot of pesticides, and all of those things are staying in the systems um, and being washed into our uh, waterways and, our, and, and polluting our soils. And we really um, need to change our paradigm. And obviously with all the attention we have on the call tonight, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but, um, you know, human population just continues to grow. Greater demand for housing is forcing us, you know, into smaller, smaller lots, um, forcing developers to turn these lots over more quickly. So the, the thought of conservation is really not even a consideration. It's all, it's, it's unfortunately really profit driven. Um, and we're displacing and destroying uh, untold species in the process. Um, and biodiversity is really key to just the health of the planet. And that's really my, I would say the, the number one thing I would, I tell people about native landscaping is focus on diversity. Um, and it's, you know, native plants, it's, it's the, all the different species in the ecosystem that make it so valuable. Hey, Alan, I just wanted to make sure your screen went off of the presentation mode. Oh, wow, okay. You may just need to reshare to make sure it goes back to your PowerPoint. It just okay. a second ago. Where did, where did I leave off? Uh, I think just, yeah, right there. Okay. And go, yeah, make sure it's in presentation. Perfect. Sorry about that. <laughs> we'll jump through this real quick. Um, sorry, guys. A little derailed here. So, um, you know, obviously, why should we use natives? You know, we just touched on a lot of things, water conservation, but it's it's really uh, goes deeper to conserving the wildlife. It's really conserving the planet and ultimately conserving ourselves and, and really benefiting our own health. Um, so, so, you know, human encroachment has obviously been a major impact on all of wildlife and you know so we do have a little bit of a responsibility to kind of try to put it back um but like i said the diversity is really key and it's all about these ecosystems and i think you know we we do kind of lose sight that we are connected you know whether we like it or not we are connected to the health of the planet and we can build all the cities and sky rises and and beautiful homes but at the end of the day our water and our food are coming from the planet and we have to make, make sure that we're taking care of that. Um, so there's been a lot of research um, recently in the last you know, several decades um, on a topic ecotherapy. And it's essentially, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's almost common sense to me and, and maybe I take it for granted because I do work outside so much, but um, you know, people who, have to work in offices and, you know, and, and are forced to kind of be indoors, especially in the winter time with, uh, you know, shorter days. Um, it's very, very depressing. You know, you, you, you almost get seasonal affect disorder, you know, even though we aren't so far North, like people in Alaska or near the North pole, um, you know, not having sunlight, not being exposed to the outdoors. It's, uh, it's really detrimental to our health and you almost don't feel it. And it, 
but it, it does accumulate and adds up and then you know creates problems that we will see down the road um you know heart disease uh, diabetes things like that so these are all um these are all things that people are doing research on now and starting to find correlations with um, a lack of being exposed to nature so you know this this bottom line a stanford led uh, research team um, basically found evidence that you know just walking out in nature really just helps reduce your depression so you know bring it home and this is um you know i got into horticulture th first and foremost from herpetology you know I, I used to catch these these animals here uh this is the eastern box turtle and a green tree frog on the right and um you know the, the green tree frog was probably my first pet I found one in the gutter standing outside with my father one one morning, uh, probably five years old. And I have I vividly have that memory and it sticks with me. And you know, that's what has kind of instilled this passion in me to preserve these creatures. And, and you know, I, I hope no one on this call finds these uh, these pictures off putting at all, because these are incredibly beautiful and complex animals to me. This box turtle on the left, it, it will live. 25 30 years maybe you know maybe even longer if it's lucky you know if it doesn't have to cross the road too many times um even the tree frog can live you know several years so these are not you know short-lived you know fleeting things i mean they're around and they stay in your yard they become a part of your you know environment they're your neighbors and it's really our duty to kind of protect them um one thing i want to point out you know looking at the tree frog you see the white line going down the side so this is an, um, an adaptation of camouflage that really helps to break up that pattern of the, the body shape um, that predators are going to be looking for as they kind of, you know, look through these plants. They're looking for that shape of a frog. Well, that line helps to really break up that pattern. And if you look just above on the leaf above, not the one they're sitting on, but above, and you see the white cream kind of stripe through the center of the leaf. Well, that is a Florida anis uh, shrub, Elysium floridanum. So this is a shrub that is in the same environment, um, overlaps the same habitat as the green tree frog. So this this frog has adapted, you know, to really mimic this leaf on this plant. And it doesn't mean that he can't hide and be safe on other plants, but he matches this one so much better that if there's more of Elysium around, which would be in his natural environment, there's a much greater success rate for the species, you know, and this is, you know, not necessarily proven research, but you can just see the similarities of this frog and the color and the shape to the leaf above. And, you know, it, I don't think it's a coincidence that these, this plant and animal species overlap their habitat significantly. Um, you know, I think it's a, a testament to how important it is to use the natives. So, um, you know, really it's all about really understanding the ecosystem in general. So, you know, for any ecosystem um, you have, or let's, I guess for a woodland ecosystem, because in, uh, obviously if there's no uh, trees, you, you don't have a canopy, but um, we'll, we'll focus on the forest for now. So upper canopies, your large trees, uh, your mid-story, understory is your smaller trees and larger shrubs, and then your ground covers. So that's gonna be your smaller shrubs under, you know, six feet or so. And all your herbaceous stuff, so um, perennials, annuals, and grasses. All all of these things are important, and it's really necessary to have at least some aspect of all of this. So um, your upper canopy, it's really you're gonna have to go with what you have. You're not gonna really go gonna be able to plant, you know, fully grown, you know, massive oaks and and maples and really any of these trees. I mean, it, it, it does happen from time to time, but it's incredibly expensive. And um, it's really not something a, a homeowner should should try to take on. So you really want to start by identifying what you have to begin with and kind of building off of that. So your uh, really common deciduous hardwoods, uh, your oaks, there's uh, dozens of different species of oaks that we have here, um, several different maples, several different hickories. Uh, tulip poplar is another really uh, common tree that we see around. Sweet gum, sourwood, sassafras, um, all of those have really great fall color. And persimmon, um, you know, sourwood is a great pollen uh, nectar source. You have sourwood honey is a, is a really a commodity. 
uh, sassafras is the host for the spice bush swallowtail butterfly and uh, historically was the source for uh, root beer but uh, safriol is the compound that um, has been shown to cause cancer so they no longer use sassafras for root beer but that was originally where it came from um, and persimmon uh, has a really plentiful fruit that I've, I have uh, several persimmon trees in my backyard and I've never been able to get ripe persimmons because the possums, I have a possum that moves in every every fall and will eat the persimmons long before they're ready to eat. And uh, the deer will come along and, and raccoons will come along. So this is a really great source of food there. Um, then you have your evergreens, pines, hemlocks, more uh, a little bit further in the mountains. I think I saw someone from Blairsville, so they'll they'll definitely recognize the hemlocks. But I have one in my yard too. Um, I've lost I lost one last year uh, in the, the heat of the summer. So they you know they need this kind of stay moist if we're going to plant one um, near the Athens area or even further south along the coastal plain. Um, they can tolerate the heat, but not if they get dry. So um, and ultimately they really are from the mountains. Um, but then you have other evergreens that aren't necessarily conifers or aren't conifers, uh, such as magnolias that everyone's familiar with, the giant sweet uh, southern magnolia. And uh, American hollies are another uh, evergreen that you could find. And uh, wax myrtle is another that I'll include here, although it's not really for the upper canopy. It's a little bit more of the understory, but they can grow quite large if given space. Um, so these, this is really important. It kind of is the foundation for the ecosystem. Um, it provides uh, roosting habitat, nesting uh, habitat for birds, obviously, but also for a lot of mammals, um, bats, um, squirrels, and raccoons will all live in the trees. Um, and then, you know, they're they're finding more and more. There's more and more research being done discovering how important the um, root structure in symbiotic relationship with the mycorrhizal fungus that's in the soil that's really ever present, um, at least in soils that haven't been so disturbed. Um, so they're finding uh, incredible interactions that happen at this at this root at the root level, um, at the feeder roots, um, at the drip line of the trees and and a little bit further out. Um, changing uh, soil pH, um, changing you know the other chemistries of the soil, mainly through but through changing the pH, but um, also recruiting uh, beneficial nematodes. As you know, Laura, that's her favorite animal is <laughs> the nematode. Um, they're incredibly important to the health of the ecosystem, and they really work in conjunction with the plants. The fungus and the plants work together to really help uptake nutrients better, um, absorb water better, you know, make better use of the water available. So it's, it's all, it's all connected. And that's what really makes this so fascinating to me and, and really why we have to kind of take a closer look and, and really do our part. Um, so like I said, the foundation of the ecosystem, your tree, um, diversity, the, the predominant species you have is going to kind of dictate uh, a lot of things that can happen beneath the trees. So, um, you know, to continue on the hardwoods a little bit longer, um, major food sources are really nuts, but also um, provide a host to insects, which is also part of the food chain. So you get a lot of foraging from birds and bats and and uh, even possums and things like that that'll be you know up in the trees, and host for edible mushrooms. You know we talked. I was just talking about the uh, root fungus, but we do have a lot of symbiotic relationships with a lot of mushrooms that are highly prized in a, a culinary field, like chanterelles, uh, even truffles. Truffles grow off of uh, oaks and uh, pecans, and you know lion's mane on beaches and uh, and maples. And so these are all, it's all connected. It's all, all uh, important. You get tremendous uh, fall leaf color with a lot of these hardwoods that you don't get with evergreens too, which is really, uh, um, really kind of unique for temperate forest. 
And the one thing I'll talk about in a little bit is um, spring ephemeral perennials. So um, the spring ephemerals can only really occur in these deciduous hardwood forests. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but it's a really, really unique relationship that's uh, really fascinating and, and just goes to kind of uh, reinforce the depth of complexity of these relationships. Um, so evergreens is the other side, you know, if it's not deciduous, then it's, I guess, um, could be semi evergreen, but we can walk into that. Um, then you have uh, conifers will provide, the, you know, they have cones, that's the def by definition, um, inside the cones are the seeds. So uh, uh, several bird species have adapted to be very specialized to be able to wedge their beaks inside these cones and pry out those seeds. So, you know, they're really uh, become specialized and dependent on these predominantly uh, conifer forests. Um, so things, uh, birds such as the crossbill and, and gross beaks and uh, some other, and some finches um, are really only going to be around if you have predominantly evergreens and conifers specifically. Um, you do have uh, hollies or another evergreen that can provide late winter food source for many bird species. And uh, I think hollies are very um, quintessential for kind of wintertime, um, you know, decorations. Um, pines are very resinous and that um, has a, basically creates a unique relationship with fire. So there is a really important role of fire in maintaining the understory and keeping it open and, um, you know, really keeping down a lot of these invasive, uh, exotic invasive species that have moved in that can grow much quicker and choke out the native wildlife and vegetation. So, you know, having periodic burns is really something that we have got to embrace again and get back to as a cultural practice. Um, and particularly in South Georgia, we have uh, these major pine plantations essentially growing pulpwood and, and lumber and and you know they they have to manage with fires they have to because you know all the debris that falls below and collects if they aren't regularly uh, burning it and suppressing that uh, that um, energy load that fuel load then in the event of um, you know a lightning strike or you know someone throwing a cigarette out the window driving down the highway causing a wildfire you know, it can grow out of control very, very quickly as we've seen out West really like all, all year and for, for several years in a row here. Um, you know, so pines have that kind of unique uh, relationship to fire and uh, longleaf pine in particular uh, will really only germinate after being exposed to temperatures uh, high enough that uh, you would see in a fire. So um, it's really essential. You know, fires also kind of suppress things like fire ants, which um, are really killing a lot of species, particularly uh, species that aren't so mobile, like uh, amphibians or reptiles that, you know, live under logs and rocks and things like that. So uh, we'll get into the mid-story, understory. So this is going to be uh, really where we can start having our impact on, on shaping our own uh, ecosystems. Um, you know, these are these are the kinds of things we're going to be planting as homeowners or, or landowners. Redbud trees are really popular. Um, you see them early spring. They're one of the first things you notice to, to tell you springs around the corner, and uh, they really spread well and, and thrive in our uh, our temperate forests here. Um, pawpaw is a, a funny name, but a really a really amazing plant. Um, it's very uh, closely related to uh, tropical, some tropical fruits that it's really the only uh, member of that family that uh, we have here. But um, wildlife love, love pawpaw. I mean, it's a great source of food for many wildlife species. Um, viburnums, there's many different viburnums that have a lot of really good benefits. Um, great pollen sources, great nectar sources, and uh, also have great uh, fruit for birds and they'll rarely persist into the winter. They'll be uh, totally eaten long before it gets cold. 
Um, then we have dogwoods. Um, everyone's familiar with the classic dogwood, the um, quintessential dogwoods we have here, but there are several different dogwood species that can be a little bit more uh, shrubby and even almost a ground cover. Um, Lindera is a common name spice bush. So this is the host for the spice bush swallowtail. Um, rhododendron here is the deciduous rhododendron. So these are our native azaleas. Um, they've started to become more popular in culture recently. Um, and it's one of my favorite plants, but it's also one of the deer his favorite plants. So it can be difficult to grow um, right along with hydrangea. Oak leaf hydrangea is an amazing plant, but the deer will eat it to the ground. So it's kind of difficult. Um, you know, you have to understand when you build wildlife habitat, you will bring in wildlife and, you know, sometimes you're feeding that wildlife. Um, and that's essentially what we got, what we're doing. Um, so, you know, if you do have a specimen you want to maintain, you know, just use a cage and put a cage around it. And after, in my experience, um, once the shrubs get to be, you know, over six foot deer, you know, they're not browsing with their head up. They're really browsing more with their head down. So, you know, anything below like four, four feet or so, they're going to kind of leave it alone and, and move on. Vacciniums, vacciniums are blueberries. So there's, we have several different wild blueberry species. Um, I live off Tallahassee Road here in Athens, Georgia, and across from my neighborhood is a, a really nice section of forest, about 500 acres. Um, I know the University of Georgia has about 300 or so acres that they're preserving, um, but I'm, I'm privileged and lucky enough to be able to go and explore the tra trails back there. And, and there's several different vaccinium species. Um, it's really the predominant uh, understory plant there. And what most people are probably used to seeing is Chinese privet, but in an undisturbed forest here in Georgia and the rest of the Southeast, vacciniums would really be the dominant species instead of the privet. So it kind of would re replace the privet. Um, beautyberry, uh, uh, Calicarpa americana is one of my favorite plants. Um, really great source of berries and uh, nectar and does have some interesting fall color it turns kind of a lime green before it drops its leaves. Uh, sweet shrub, Calicanthus is another one that I really like. Um, it's kind of uh, rem reminiscent of like allspice or cinnamon a little bit. Has a kind of interesting uh, different flower. Um, sweet spire, uh, Itea, Itea virginica is sweet spire. It blooms early spring, has some great fall color. Um, it's a, and it really tolerates wet soil as well. So we'll get into that one later. Summer sweet, Clethera is another one that um, does well alongside sweet spire. And witch hazel, these are all really uh, popular common shrubs. Um, some of the evergreen stuff that you might see or might want to plant is uh, cherry laurel. Um, has really good food source for uh, a lot of bees. Um, provides nectar for a lot of uh, bumblebees. Um, hollies, we touched on earlier. Sweet Bay Magnolia is a host to several butterfly species and is a really semi evergreen. It will drop its leaves like every third year, but it has some beautiful trunk structure. So it's kind of nice when it does drop. Um, and it, it doesn't get nearly as large as the Southern Magnolia. So it can be used much closer to the house and can be used as much more of a specimen um, can be pruned back um, and kept as multiple tr trunks or used as a single trunk specimen. Uh, Calmia is uh, mountain laurel. Um, so Blairsville, you're very familiar with that. Um, there is a really nice patch of mountain laurel in Tallahassee Forest, but it's, it's really special to be here this far south. Um, this plant um, is really quintessential for the mountains and it does not like to be moved, does not like to be transplanted or taken uh, cuttings of. So it's kind of tricky to grow and harder to find in, uh, in nurseries. But if you go up into North Carolina, Tennessee, it'll, it'll be everywhere. Uh, Elysium I touched on earlier is one of my favorite plants. It's uh, anise. It has the smell of licorice and has some real funky flowers that have a little a bit of a weird smell. It's, it's fly pollinated, so it's uh, kind of similar to Bradford pear. I'm sure people are familiar with, but 
not nearly as strong as that. I don't like bread for pear at all, but um, Lysium is a really cool plant. And there's several varieties that are seen in uh, commercial production that um, you know you can you can find pretty regularly. Um, rhododendron here is the evergreen rhododendron. So this is another one that you'd find more up in the mountains. Um, they they will do okay here, and you'll see some specimens in in our area and throughout the southeast. I, I'm not so sure you'll find too many down in uh, South Georgia, but um, anyone want to pipe in and correct me, I'll I'll be fine uh, to take the information. But they don't do well with our humidity and the heat in the summer. So it's one of the plant it's one of these plants that needs really 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 well draining soil, but can never dry out. And that's that's kind of a tricky uh, balance. So you'll see them oftentimes growing out over a riverbank where you know the top of you know on a high hill on a high side where you know the root ball is really dry, but they're able to get their roots down and uh, get a drink of water in the dry times. Um, wax myrtle, yes. Sorry, I'll, don't forget the wax myrtle. But um, I did want to. I think you're probably going to sort of repeat what you said. But in going back to the mountain laurel, we did mm -hmm. have. A specific question you mentioned that you've seen it here and i've seen it here i've never had success with it personally yeah um, do you have any idea if they're because it is a beautiful plant i know a lot of people would love to grow it when i say here by the way for listeners online it's uh, athens georgia and the piedmont here but not quite in the mountains um mm -hmm. do you know if there's like varieties or anything that would help people try to grow them in the piedmont or can you just try and see if it works what yeah i mean What's so tricky about mountain laurel is it has a it has a really uh, strong relationship with that symbiotic uh, mycorrhizal fungus that we were talking about earlier. So that's what makes it so hard for growers to keep in containers because the containers get so hot in the summertime um, that bacteria just or the fungus I'm sorry just can't really persist in those containers. So it's not so much that it, it you can't grow it in the ground. It's just that it's not readily available because nurseries can't keep it. Um, you can find it certainly up in North Carolina and in the mountains. I'm, I bet you could find it. I've come across it a few times on a few availabilities of nurseries. You know, I'm, I'm constantly finding new nurseries with uh, my role with Surfscape. Um, we're always bringing new farms onto our network uh, to source from. And so that's, that's really my major role. So I'm always looking for these plants. And I, I have not found it further south than like Middle Tennessee and around Carolina. So, you know, if you really, really want to try mountain laurel, um, just take a weekend and, and drive up to the mountains and, you know, maybe take a pickup truck or, uh, you know, minivan. And, and uh, I don't think that you will would fail miserably. I mean, I think if you prepared a really nice spot, you treat it very similarly. If you have rhododendrons, evergreen rhododendrons, and have had success with them, I think you would be just fine with mountain laurels. But um, it's just hard to find because nurseries can't keep them in containers. That's really, the, I think, the bigger issue. No, that's fascinating. That's great to know. And I will say one of our participants made a point that sort of um, is in line with that, that she's had success transplanting it within her yard. So like if you have a friend in town and you know they have some, maybe you should just go pop it over from yard to yard instead of putting <laughs> it in here. Well, get as big a root ball as you can, I would say, because I've, I, I've had very limited success. I, I'm typically pretty good at moving stuff around and transplanting stuff. And that's one that I've um, really, I've got like one plant that's done really well. And I took about five or six cuttings. Um, they were like, they were layer branches that I came across and um, really only had one good success with one now. So it's now starting to flush out and uh, I think it's going to end up being a really nice plant, but um, it's, it's gone. It's been very slow. It's been about three years and it's finally put on some significant growth. Um, wax myrtle, I just want to touch on, it's a really, really uh, versatile plant, can handle some drought, but also can handle, you know, being really wet and, and like so roadside ditches. Um, it's the source of, of like bayberry, bayberry candle, if, uh, if you really like that smell, that's wax myrtle. Um, birds also really, really like it, uh, has a lot of berries for birds too, so. Um, 
you know, your mid store is really going to be your uh, habitat for a lot of bird species to nest and hide and forage. Um, touched on the vaccinians before. I think I really probably touched on all this stuff already. Um, viburnums that I really like. Arrowwood is really cool. Um, it so individual species have fall color, so not you know in general you can't. I can't say that every one you get will have nice fall color, but um, individuals can have really nice red fall color. Same with maple leaf viburnum, uh, black haw viburnum. Um, they all have a little bit different shape to them and have different uses. I'd say black haw is a good kind of replacement for a specimen dogwood. It gets much taller and has a much greater tree form to it. Uh, both arrowwood and maple leaf would be more of a ground cover kind of hedge um, screen um, shrub that you would use. So I'd say maple leaf would be probably the lower growing one. Arrowwood's going to get, you know, maybe six to eight feet tall um, and grow straight up, which is where it gets the name arrowwood. Native Americans used them to make arrows. Um, so it's not going to be real branchy. Maple leaf's going to be a little bit bushier. Um, great source of flowers and berries and fall color really and we talked about spice bush so so here's uh one of my calicarpa i have in the backyard and you can see about halfway down where the birds have just been going to town on it and taking all those berries off and uh i have uh i believe i have a photo later that will be almost the exact same spot and you'll see like two weeks prior that it was covered in berries, but uh, mockingbirds and gray catbirds in particular, in my yard at least, just love these this plant. So, um, sweet spire, I think we talked about all these and I'll get around to talking about them again when we get to the uh, rain garden section. So we'll just move on. Here's a nice patch of pawpaw that I found out in the uh, Talus forest area when I was out foraging for mushrooms uh, a couple months back. And um, you know, this I believe is Asamina parviflora. So it's the dwarf pawpaw, it's not tree loba. Tree loba gets much, much taller. Um, this one, you can sort of see how the leaves are kind of downcast and a little bit more of an umbrella shape. Um, you know, that's why I believe it's parviflora, but um, you know, that's just my uh, observation. So it gets us into ground covers. Um, I'm including some kind of smaller shrubs as ground covers here. New Jersey tea is one that I'm um, starting to grow. I've had for about a year now. Um, Ceanothus americanus. It was used as a replacement for tea, like in the Revolutionary uh, War times, you know, around the Boston Tea Party times. So hence the name New Jersey tea. Um, I have not tried it out myself. Like I said, I'm just now starting to grow it, but it does have some really nice white flowers. It reminds me of a small hydrangea. Um, so like kind of a, you know, two foot by two foot or three foot uh, uh, spread for, and, and the flowers to me are similar to um, a cluster of hydrangea flowers, but um, not quite as showy. Um, partridge berries are really cool ground cover has really, really small leaves and will creep and cover an area pretty quickly and has a really cool little uh, double flower that becomes a single berry, which is just just really weird. And uh, I really don't have a good explanation for why this is, but I'm sure there's some evolutionary uh, relationship with the pollinator, but um, kind of an interesting plant. And then uh, we talked about viburnum acerifolium folium that's the maple leaf uh vaccinium darawai is the dwarf blueberry um it remains green and will blush there's some varieties on the market um roses blush is one that's really popular and it, it will blush uh purples and pinks and and some deep kind of blue greens in the fall and the new growth that comes out has a lot of these colors as well um you know this is going to be your ground covers are going to be your perennials um, and most of these are going to be your pollinator hosts and your herbaceous food source for your rodents and other mammals and then your grasses um, carrick species i really like using um, in woodland areas where they get kind of part shade 
keep in mind the more sun something gets the better it's going to grow so you know just because something can tolerate shade doesn't mean it's going to become a specimen there um, but carex seems to do really well in these kind of dry mesic uh, woodland hillsides um, and that's that's really my backyard um, and a lot of backyards throughout the southeast you know where we had cotton plantations and, and terraces and just the the uh, erosion ruts and and kind of foothills um, you'll see carrots different carrot species everywhere and these are sedges so they're technically not a grass but um, that's really just a technicality that's not really important for this discussion <laughs> um, they are also hosts for a lot of uh, different butterfly species and moth species and other insects as well um, and also just obviously provide habitat for insects so you know it can be really become the base of the food chains so you know that's why it's really important to have a little bit of all of this and that creates the diversity both in the the plant palette that we have in our landscape but also in the um, different animal species that will come and visit and ultimately stay and become part of your ecosystem at your own house. A uh, little blue stem is one that I think we'll get into later, but I'll bring it up if we don't. So here's the uh, Michelle Ripens partridge berry. It's just a funky little flower. I mean, that thing is tiny. Um, I mean, less than an eighth of an inch across. So that's really super zoomed in. Those leaves are really small. But that those two flowers, once pollinated, will become one berry. And that's just, I'm not really even sure how that happens, but if you kind of see on the left side how the flower comes together into the ovary there. So I guess that's really how that becomes one. Um, so this is just a quick shot of kind of the center of my backyard. Um, how we use natives is is um, one thing we need to touch on is cultivars of natives. This is kind of a debate that's you know I hear amongst horticulturists. Um, most people I've spoken with, and most growers I work with, don't really see a, a important distinction between um, using uh, using species instead of using native R. So. A nativar is a cultivar of the native. A cultivar is a essentially, um, if you grow any plant, you know, they individual plants have individual genetics. And so what happens is you grow enough of them, every once in a while you see some some differences. You see some some genetic uh, diversity, just like in in people. And so sometimes these are beneficial uh, characteristics and, and those characteristics can be continued to be bred in through cloning or through um, you know uh, cross-pollinating with seeds and so these become you know once through through trials it's really a long process but um, you essentially are creating a, a separate plant from the parent so it's you know I guess that's where the debate comes in is, is this really responsible? Are we truly recreating habitat if we're using cultivars? And most people I've spoken with have not seen any reason not to use cultivars. Um, like I said, this is, you know, I don't think there's been a whole lot of, of long-term research done on this. And frankly, the industry wants to develop these cultivars because each cultivar can be patented and there's a tremendous amount of money to be made so you know it's one of those things where we may really never know but i do know that if you want to buy itia you're not going to find the species itia you're going to get henry's garnet because that's just what people are growing um henry's garnet has a bit brighter red color in the fall and it has a little bit tighter growth habit and that's typically what growers are looking for is a plant that's not quite so wild looking and um you know or has other features like longer bloom time bigger blooms you know stronger fall color so those are all the kinds of things that would uh, facilitate a cultivar being bred and so you know in my opinion you know, if you want ITA because you want that bright fall color, then you want Henry's Garnet. 
Um, and it's still got the flowers. It still brings in the wildlife. And so I don't think there's any you know, real detrimental um, impact there. But this is still an ongoing debate. Um, you have Henry's garden, and you have Little Henry, which is just a even more uh, diminutized uh, cultivar. So you know, they typically these cultivars go bigger to smaller. Um, you know, people are always trying to find more dwarf varieties because you can fit more plants into a landscape and sell more plants to the client and make more money. So it's unfortunately, um, you know, a little bit profit driven, but, um, you know, it takes money to keep these things going. And, and, you know, I have to make money to, to do my, to, to promote these things as well. So, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a necessary evil. Um, hydrangea quercifolia, oak leaf hydrangea, ruby slippers is a dwarf variety because oak leaf hydrangea can get well over 10 feet tall if given, you know, good sunlight and, and moisture. Uh, ruby slippers will stay closer to uh, like five or six feet. And you have munchkin, which is supposed to stay two to three. And I say supposed to because, you know, the original parent plant gets over 10, 15 feet tall. So, you know, you, you do tend to see, or you can tend to see uh, cultivars kind of reverting back to their old habits. I, I know uh, my parents are actually on this call and they, they were one of the first adopters of the Laura Petalum uh, uh, Razzleberry fringe bush, I think is what the first cultivar they bought at Home Depot maybe 35 years ago. And they were told, this is a new thing. It's the greatest thing. It's going to be a dwarf fringe tree. Well, it's a tree. It's, it's a fringe tree. And they planted these things thinking they were going to stay, you know, four or five feet tall. And within two years, they had dwarfed the red maple that was in between them. And, and they, we had to cut them down to the ground. And, and they certainly were not dwarfs. Um, so that is one thing to kind of keep in mind. If it's, the, if it's brand new and just been on the market, you may want to kind of wait a while and see, you know, if it really does uh, pan out to be as great as, as it's touted. Um, you know, be, these early adopters uh, sometimes don't always work out. Um, Yopon holly is another really good example um, of cultivars kind of run wild. Um, there's so many dwarf varieties of Yopon holly that I can't I can't even keep them all straight. And you and you laid them all side by if you laid them all side by side and took you know ten steps back, you would have no idea which one was which. They're all essentially the same thing. So you know some of the ways that I really when people ask how do I use natives in landscape um, to me these are kind of the main things that stand out seasonally seasonal gardens I think is the the biggest impact you can get uh, from using natives versus using um, like our evergreen azaleas from uh, China um, a, a lot of our ornamental plants come from East Asia and uh, a lot of them tend to be evergreen tend to be ever blooming and they just don't change. They they're they're bred and and uh, brought here because they're consistent. And there's a there's certainly a place for that. But if you want a really dynamic landscape that changes throughout the seasons, you really want to incorporate natives. Um, you know, obviously wildlife gardens. That's really my big passion and and how I even got into horticulture. And I think obviously obviously one of the best reasons to use natives is to rebuild that ecosystem for the wildlife and um, have that connection to nature. And then rain gardens, you know, getting back to the water conservation, um, there are tremendous benefits to utilizing native plants to help us conserve and clean and, um, you know, reuse our uh, rainwater off of driveways, off of, uh, off of roofs, you know, collecting downspout water, um, and so we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and there's there's there is some technical aspects of this that need to be considered. Um, and then obviously you just have a specimen garden like my backyard is uh, has a lot of uh, just well, it's really the land of misfit plants. But those misfit plants, once put in the ground and, and tended to uh, can become really, you know, botanical specimens. And then we have uh, the naturalized edges. Um, you know, if you have a big property, you have a lot of room to fill up with natives. And, uh, you know, I really encourage you, instead of throwing in, you know, half acre lawn, 
you know, put in, put in a little lawn around your front door, you know, as an entrance, you know, uh, kind of courtyard, but then utilize your space to grow some really uh, low maintenance and high wildlife benefit uh, plants. And, and those are going to be your natives. So here's a, a photograph um, of just the edge of a uh, neighborhood uh, took just last week and you see all the different fall color. Um, different maples here, there's tulip poplar, some oaks that haven't quite started turning yet. And then you do see a few kind of mixed uh, evergreens in there. So obviously, you know, if you're trying to get seasonal dynamic landscaping, you're selecting plants that you want to select plants that are going to change. Um, hydrangea quercifolia I touched on earlier, oak leaf hydrangea has huge uh, white panicle flowers in the fall um, into the, I mean, I'm sorry, in the spring into the summer. It has a really, really strong red fall color. Um, and then also, you know, has pretty interesting structure, especially if you are decent at pruning and, and want to attend one of our uh, pruning lectures later in the year. Um, you know, you can uh, really utilize a deciduous plant, um, pruning a deciduous plant in the wintertime, you can shape it and, and create some really interesting structure. Um, the, our native azaleas are some of my favorites. I'm still, uh, I finally gotten the deer out of the yard with uh, an eight foot fence all around, but now I'm, uh, I've got five different species of native azaleas and they all bloom slightly different times. Um, you know, we can't plant, I think there's, there's over a dozen different species and a lot of them just won't grow here. They do not handle the, the humidity in the summer. Um, they're, they're mountain, truly like mountain top plants. Um, and they, and some of them have very, very small limited ranges because of this. They, you know, they may only grow on the eastern side of a certain mountain slope. So, you know, we're not going to be able to recreate that. Um, but some that I've seen uh, be very successful in this area, um, Kinesins is um, a white with kind of a pink throat to it. Um, Austrinum is the flame, the orange flame. Um, the Florida flame is sometimes called. Um, Florida orange, sometimes called, and then uh, Calendulaceum is also uh, called the flame, but it's a deeper orange red color. And there's, you know, there is diversity in each individual too. And there's a lot of uh, hybridizing and a lot of uh, different combinations. So, but planting all three of these in your yard will give you slightly different bloom times and kind of uh, spread out that color throughout the year. And then all the different vaccinium species, um, you know, they're, they're during the summer, you know, it's really just a green shrub with small green leaves, but you know, they're all blueberries. They have uh, really interesting white and pink flowers in the spring, um, provide great food source. You, you know, the birds will eat the berries before you can, I guarantee you, <laughs> and will give you really strong fall color, uh, typically reds, sometimes deep dark reds, sometimes bright, bright red. Uh, sparkleberry is one that has a particularly nice uh, trunk structure to it and a really nice uh, kind of bark structure. And this is one that, although the leaves are very, very different, I would say is, is very similar to mountain laurel um, in its structure. And then service berry is uh, a small tree and it's usually typically grown multi-stemmed um, is how you'll see it at a lot of nurseries. Um, it's cultivated that way to kind of give it more of a spread. And um, it's, it's not a very long lived tree, but you know, typically 15, 20 years. And um, it does provide you a really nice seasonal dynamic uh, centerpiece in your yard. Um, so here, you know, this picture got a little squished, but you know, here's the Canessens on the left, the Florida Flame in the middle, and then the uh, Calendulaceum on the right. Um, and, you know, you see they're, they're uh, just really beautiful, beautiful shrubs. Um, and they'll get quite, quite large. I mean, you can see the, uh, the the two pictures on the left. Both of those have probably been in the ground 30 years. And they're, uh, you know, almost 30 feet tall. I mean, they're very large with the spread probably closer to 40, 45 feet. I mean, they're very, very massive, massive shrubs, small trees, really. Um, the cornice species, that's your dogwoods. 
Uh, red twig dogwood is a really interesting one. Um, it's starting to kind of be used a lot in designs. Um, it's a little quirky because it's a bright red and I'll show you a picture in a second. Uh, silky dogwood is one that I'm starting to grow and, and play around with because it's a really uh, useful plant for stabilizing um, erosion on stream banks and, and uh, kind of um, reclaiming wetland areas. So this one is used in a lot of restoration projects and it provides a great food source and a great flower um, as well and does have a little bit of a, um, a red kind of um, mottled red uh, fall color. Then we have sassafras, uh, sourwood, maple, you know, reds and oranges, and then your hickories is three or four different hickories that we could we could have here and they're all, you know, some shade of yellow and pretty, pretty dramatic yellow. Um, the roost species, uh, your sumacs, and this does include um, the poison sumac and poison ivy. I don't know if anyone's ever paid too much attention, but poison ivy turns a bright, bright red in the fall. It's actually a beautiful plant um, if you just keep your distance from it. And, it. and it actually provides a lot of berries for birds, which is how it spreads so readily and, and really takes over a forest. But, um, you know, sumacs may be one of my favorites right now, but there are some challenges to growing it, and we'll get to that uh, towards the end. Um, then you have uh, a nice little collection that I like to work with together. Um, they all have different bloom times, but Itea, Clethra, Fothergilla, and uh, the Hemimelis is a uh, witch hazel. Fothergilla and uh, which is, is in the witch hazel family too. So they all have similar um, structure to them. I'd say Clethra is probably the most upright, but the other three are you know pretty moundy and kind of kind of low low shrubs and um hemimelis will bloom in the fall uh itia will bloom in early spring and fothergilla will be right behind it and then clethra will bloom in the summer so you know using all four of these together in the same area um you're going to really have a, a constant seasonal interest but it's going to it's going to jump from plant to plant and to me that's just a really cool way to do to build a dynamic uh, landscape so on the left is the uh, silky dogwood and you can see the berries in the middle uh, that's a great source of food for birds and um, you know the fall color is interesting it's, it starts yellow turns red you know there's a lot of different colors there that's just one that's one plant so you, know, you get a lot of different colors there and then the uh, red twig dogwood. It's like I said, it's bright red. It's it's interesting, and I've seen it used a lot as um, kind of the centerpiece for um, a, in a more formal garden, you know, maybe surrounded by boxwoods even, where you have a, a deep green you know, formal hedge, and then you have just this crazy bright red, uh, you know, shooting twigs everywhere. So a lot of people um, will actually cut this down to the ground. Um, and basically coppice it. coppicing is a, a technique where you take a, a single trunk plant, you cut it really low to the ground, maybe three inches. And as a result, what you're doing is uh, forcing the dormant buds below the cut to really uh, emerge. And you're creating a, a multi-stemmed, um, where it'll, it'll shoot out many, many stems. So uh, this is a technique that's used um, with witch hazel also. Um, in England, even they they will build hedgerows this way. Uh, you plant a few um, single stem plants uh, about four inches or four feet apart, and then after a few seasons, you go back and cut them all to within three inches to the ground, and those single trunks become you know four or five trunks, and then and and they grow out at a much smaller diameter. And are much flexible and can even be woven into a fence and and uh, can be shaped and, and braided and, and there's a lot of really interesting things that can be done um, using a coppicing technique and um, I have seen that with this red twig dogwood um, and because it's got such a crazy red color and it's only that color you know red twig is important it's really only in these smaller diameter more flexible twigs it doesn't the color definitely fades to a darker reddish brown um, as the trunk starts to get a little girth on it, you know, closer to, you know, two or three inches. And once it gets 
a little bit thicker than your finger um, or your thumb, it's not, it's going to start losing that bright color. So uh, spring ephemerals is something that's really unique to our uh, northern hemisphere um, or our, um, I should say, our temperate forests. Um, I know at least in North America, uh, yeah, I can't speak to uh, the southern hemisphere actually, but um, essentially what happens, you know, flowering is a really uh, energy intensive process for any plant. And so these perennials have adapted to growing in deep, deep shade where there's very little sunlight through most of the growing season once the upper canopy leaves out you know, all that shade um, is cast down on them. So these plants have adapted to pop up super early, like late winter, early spring. And they grow out quick, they flower very quickly. And, you know, they're done blooming by early spring. And this, and at that point, that's when the trees now are starting to put on their leaves. So they've been able to put out their leaves and go ahead and flower and procreate and spread their seeds um before the forest shades them out essentially and so um there's a there's a long list of plants that kind of fall under this category and by the middle of the summer i mean you really will have a hard time finding where they were so you know sometimes i even have to put out flags to remind myself that there's something there um because they will disappear completely and you think you're like oh wow that thing died it didn't make it at all um and i've actually had some clients that were really upset with me <laughs> Because I, um, in particular, I planted a bunch of um, Jacob's ladder, pul uh, Pulmonium ceruleum, and uh, it was beautiful. It was, uh, I mean, made a great statement. Uh, my client was so happy with it, but uh, came July and it disappeared. And she was, uh, she, you know, she really expected it to be a little bit more persistent. And so, you know, it is just important to kind of set your expectations. They make a a great statement early spring, but then uh, they will they will disappear. Trilliums kind of fall into this category. Um, Sanguinaria canadensis, the bloodroot is one of my favorites. A really, really useful medicinal plant. Um, has a similar properties to uh, iodine, so it's really astringent. Um, Claytonia, spring beauty is a really, really interesting small plant. And these are all, you know, pretty, pretty small. You know, I wouldn't say uh, showstoppers by any means, although a, a patch of blood root early in the spring is pretty pretty spectacular. And I will say Virginia bluebells makes it quite a statement as well. Um, Alan, you know, they, yes. Sorry, I hate to interrupt you because I want to hear everything that you're about to say about these. No I want to make sure that you save time for stuff like the rain garden. I just wanted to give you like a 20 minute update flag. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, let me move faster. You're good. Um, yeah, so I don't have to go through every name, that's for sure. Um, then you do have kind of the reverse, like Tipulary Discolor Cranefly Orchid. It puts out a leaf in the spring and actually blooms in the fall. The leaf still disappears in the middle of summer, and you'll think it's gone completely, but then it'll shoot up a flower stalk and really surprise you. So here's the uh, Spring Beauty Claytonia. Here's Bloodroot. This is actually the same patch, a uh, picture taken early morning and then a picture taken at noon so you can see how dramatically the leaves even the leaves open and turn and the flowers open so you know, they're very dynamic plants um and then here's a spade foot toad kind of hanging out underneath some of the blood root. you see what's happening the blood root's starting to pull back a lot of its nutrients in this foliage and it's uh, essentially getting burned up by the heat of the summer so it's starting to kind of disappear and fade um and this this guy is my friend i can go out and find him just about any time during the summer um, there's about six or seven spade foot toads that have their own little like two or three foot uh, areas that they just hang out. They don't move very much. I mean, I can pick them up, put them down. They don't, they're not <laughs> disturbed whatsoever, but they're my minions. They're eating slugs. They're eating, uh, you know, cockroaches and things like that, that I don't want. Um, so big thing, complete, complete ecosystem, um, diversity breeds diversity, plant diversity breeds animal diversity. Um, it's nice to have water features if you can be aware of your human interference. Like don't put, um, you know, your butterfly or your, don't put your bird garden right by your front door where you're constantly walking because your interference is going to really prevent that from becoming the, the habitat you want and understand your feeding, 
you're feeding wildlife, um, especially with your caterpillar hosts. You know, don't just plant one or two milkweed and think you're going to save the monarchs. Um, you really need a whole patch. You need, you know, upwards of 50 plants. And so that's hard for some people to really uh, embrace. And I understand, you know, if, but but make sure if you're going to go for it, that you do it in the right way. Um, and for birds, you can supplement food, you know, especially in extreme heat and extreme colds. So birds, bees, butterflies, they're the most uh, um, mobile. So they're going to be the ones you're going to really kind of focus on. And obviously, if you bring insects to the yard, that starts the food chain and you're going to have a lot of things kind of following and, um, and come behind it. Here's that same beauty berry. You can see all those berries before the birds get to them. And the praying mantis, if you look closely, is uh, hanging out, waiting to uh, catch any bug that happens to think the berries are flowers. And so he's just hanging out, ready. Pollinary gardens need full sun. I'm sorry to be speeding through this, but I really uh, was going too slowly. So a lot of nice grasses you can use, but this is all in the notes and you'll be able to look this up. This is a cultivar of Coreopsis. So I think this is kind of an example of how the native ours are just as good. Um, you know, if you look closely, you can see there are so many bees and wasps. I mean, thread waste wasp here, um, a couple of bees here. I mean, there's really, you know, dozens of dozens of pollinators on this little patch. So um, we'll skip through all that. We've touched on that before. You know, and it's also important for your pollinator gardens to realize that shrubs, even though they may not have flowers year round, are still providing a, a necessary habitat. So here is a butterfly sleeping in the middle of the night, just hanging out under this this leaf here. This is actually camellia, so it's not native, but you know it shows you how important it is just to have structural habitat nearby. Um, and here is a prominent caterpillar, uh, uni uh, unicorn pr prominent is the name of the butterfly, or actually it's a moth, but um, that's the larva for that uh, species there. Connect and Protect program is something that the State Botanical Garden and Mimsy Lanier uh, Center for Native Plant Studies has been doing for several years. It's a really great program where they um, grow and plant and really promote all these uh, kind of sometimes rare uh, pollinator plants. Um, here's one that's really uh, near and dear to my heart because it's so weird. <laughs> it is the um, little passion flower. And if you uh, plant it in the shade, which this one tends to grow better in the shade anyway, um, you'll get the uh, zebra long wing uh, as a host. So some uh, very important hummingbird plants, uh, scarlet honeysuckle, cross vine, and trumpet creeper are all vines. Uh, hummingbirds really stay up in the canopy more than you realize, and it's really because they're up high, you don't even see them. Um, but once you start to recognize that little, they have a little chatter to them, you'll hear them buzzing over your head a lot more than you realize. So those are, I would recommend any of those vines. Um, Lobelia cardinalis and uh, Salvia gregei are two really bright red flowers that they really can't, hummingbirds can't stay off of. So here's the Lonicera sempervirens. Um, we've talked about a lot of that stuff. So finches will come in and kind of graze seeds off of like coneflower and bergamot. So those can be incorporated as well. So here's your rain garden stuff. Um, this is a uh, littoral shelf of a retention pond that I uh, did for a subdivision a couple months back. Um, we have a uh, sweet flag, a chorus Americana on both sides. And then the far edge is um, a Junkus rush, a common rush, Junkus fussus. And uh, in the forefront is a uh, Pondotera cordata, which is pickerel weed. So all these are emergents. So as the water level rises with rain and runoff, you know, this is the retention pond for the whole neighborhood. Um, you know, and that, that littoral shelf by code, I, I believe this was Forsyth County, um, the, uh, the planting had to go back 15 feet. And so that's essentially just creating a buffer. So all this runoff coming from the uh, driveways and, and roadways is full of heavy metals, full of pollutants. And these plants uh, will really help to absorb it. Of, and, and use up a lot of those nutrients before they get to the major waterways. So, you know, certainly it's filters, but also it's habitat, you know, habitat for a lot of um, reptiles and amphibians, mainly amphibians that will eat a lot of the insects like mosquitoes that we don't want. And they also help, um, you know, in our, for our purposes, utilizing um, plants in really wet areas to help dry out that soil because the plants are 
absorbing it through the roots and then losing that moisture through transpiration at the leaf surface. Uh, that was a little minion toad that will he, that that same toad I've seen for three years now. He's that, like without a doubt the same toad in my yard. Uh, rain garden versus swale. Swale is really just a low spot. Um, if you have like continuous gradual uh, fall, then a swale is really all you need. And that's just, you know, a ditch, maybe eight inches deep at the center and maybe, uh, you know, two feet wide. And it just helps water escape and get to get somewhere. And typically that's going to um, a drain in the, or a sewer gutter. And we want to really try to capture that water and, and utilize it in, in our yards. And um, that's where rain gardens really come in. The rain garden itself is a way to capture that water and allow it to kind of percolate down and stay in the area. So we're not just shooting it off to our, uh, you know, wastewater treatment plant and then having to run our irrigation system the next day because the soil really didn't get uh, wet and, and didn't absorb that water. Here's a great list of um, plants to use for uh, wetlands. Um, I will just let you guys look at that later as reference. You know, everybody can have a copy of this. But here is a sensitive fern kind of in the foreground or in the background, I should say. In the foreground is a cardinal flower with um, that's a spice bush swallowtail uh, hanging out and getting some nectar. And then you do see the uh, pickerel weed kind of back here, here. So um, it's just a nice little mix for a rain garden. Uh, this is clethora. It's really cool. Uh, rain garden plant as well that you'll see down in South Georgia. And this is Iris Fulva Copper Flags, one of my favorites. And then Sumac, I actually took this picture this afternoon just because I was so impressed with the, the fall color that I was getting on my Sumac here. So this is actually along my driveway edge. Uh, my neighbors think I'm insane, but this is what I want. And this is, uh, I think it's beautiful. <laughs> So here's some uh, really great reference material. Um, Native Plants of Southeast is one of my go-tos. Uh, Bringing Nature Home is a great, great read and really explains a lot of the principles that we went over tonight. And then, you know, Gardener's Guide to Florida's Native Plants. You know, we're, especially in Athens and, and anywhere further south and east, the coastal plain is not very different from North Florida, you know, at least north of Orlando. And so here's... Uh, my contact info here so leave it open for questions i think we have a few minutes left <laughs> do we have anything laura yeah yeah that's great alan um so we went through we were answering some of the questions during the presentation there were a couple that i did not know the answer to or didn't get to um starting sort of near the beginning we had um this question is great and i would love to hear your input on it because as an extension agent i get a lot of similar questions um as a landscaper and probably specifically if you have any native ideas, is there a good alternative for a lawn or a landscape area alternative to grass that can handle part sunshade? That's one question, but specifically ones that can handle a little bit of traffic like dogs and walking. Yeah. Um one of the most readily used uh, lawn replacements um, that's not, I mean, I, I kind of left it out. I, I wanted to mention it, but left it out of this talk because it's a little bit more subtropical, but it's uh, Phyla nodosa, uh, P-H-Y-L-L-A, uh, nodosa, N-O-D-O-S-A. Um, it's called frog fruit, but it's a really low growing uh, member of the verbena family. So it has a similar kind of flower stalk to like your homestead verbena. That you might be familiar with um, so it's kind of a little uh, cluster with some purple light purple flowers but it handles mowing it handles being walked on really well um, liar leaf sage is another one that you'll commonly find um, it's it's essentially a, a wildflower that just pops up in your yard and um, it can handle being mowed occasionally and uh, some light foot traffic as well and then all the carex grasses are really really pretty well adapted um, to kind of filling in areas. They don't handle traffic so well. Um, I will say like Carex uh, Appalachica is probably the best at being walked on, um, you know, but typically you would just create a path and stay on the path. I mean, that's that's what I would do. Um, 
you know, and you can, that path can be a uh, hardscape that can be, you know, or it can just be a, a, a dirt path, you know, so that's, that's up to you. But um, red fescue is another one. I mean, there are, there are some native grasses that can be utilized um, as a replacement for lawns. I mean, it's just Bermuda, Bermuda, fescue, soja, centipede, those, those are so water intensive. And that's really what we got to get away from. Alan, could you, I can remind you if that, that sort of list and sort of those thoughts that you just mentioned, if you could throw that in the body of an email in the next couple of days, I'd love to both have that and also include that in the follow-up email. If that's right. Sure. Um, okay. We had another question, a quick one. You were mentioning the dwarf pawpaw earlier and showed a picture of that. Did the dwarf pawpaw fruit like the regular size pawpaw were? <laughs> It does not. No, it definitely does not. Um, Parviflorum uh, is indicative of, uh, the scientific name is indicative of the plant. It's small flowered uh, pawpaw. So mm -hmm. just by nature, having a smaller flower has a smaller fruit and doesn't have nearly as prolific of fruiting. Um, the, the tall pawpaw, just, just being a bigger tree can get up and get more sunlight and give it more energy to put out more fruit. So it's all, it's all kind of related. Um, being such a small understory plant, it's the dwarf pawpaw is just not ever going to put out much for you. Um, but I just, I thought that was a really cool picture of a naturalized area. I've never seen a patch that large. I, you know, you occasionally come across an individual here or there, but I've never seen a patch that large, which is why I included that in the talk. But I would recommend definitely the uh, Triloba, the regular pawpaw, if, especially if you um, want to eat any fruit yourself, for sure. Awesome. Um, so you actually started going into some of the Carex species in the answer to that other question, but that might be something else. If there are any uh, sedge species that you like in particular, feel free to mention them now, but if, if you want to, it's hard for people to catch them all. If you want to send us yeah. some, we can put them in the follow-up, but are there? There's, specific yeah, there's several. I mean, there's, there's probably like eight or nine that I like to use and they all have their own uses and that's why i really couldn't get into that <laughs> you know there's so much more i could dive into to really any one of these families or groups of plants i mean the, each individual species has its own niche and that's why that's what creates this diversity is including so many different you know if you love dogwoods well definitely put your specimen dogwood out there but you know don't forget there's three or four other dogwood species that are that don't even look like dogwoods but you know bring something to the table and help round out the ecosystem. So, um, yeah, I can definitely follow up with uh, kind of a list. And you know, feel free get my email and send, shoot me shoot me a message as well. You know, I'll be happy to follow up with you with any of this stuff. You know, like I said, I would love to go much deeper into any of this, but you know, we could probably spend a whole semester talking about this. Um, <laughs> so, you know, hour and a half is not anywhere close to doing it justice. Sorry, I lost my mute button. Yeah, I mean, I think we could almost do a whole class series on on this. Um, we do have a couple more questions. Let's see if we can get to a few more. Um, do most native viburnums require a cross pollinator? No, no, they do not. Um, they are, I believe, self fertile. I don't know that they even need. Um, oh, are, are vaccinium's or viburnums? I think vi vaccinium might be what they're speaking about because the blueberries typical to get fruit, fruit production. Um, most of the cultivars of blueberries are vaccinium corymbosum, which is the high bush blueberry. Um, and it's really a plant from the mountains. So it's been kind of bred down with uh, rabbit eye blueberry, which is ashai, um, and then darawai, which is southern high bush, even though it's dwarf. Um, common name is still high bush, which is just misleading. But there's the, the, to get fruit production, blueberry production for yourself, you really want to go with a cultivar of, you know, a hybrid blueberry. And then, and those typically will need at least another uh, cross pollinator. So, you know, get, uh, get a rabbit eye blueberry and get three different varieties and mix them. You know, I have probably uh, 10 different cultivars. I have a couple of Darawais, a couple of premier, uh, Ashai, a couple of Climax, a couple of Tiff Blue, and just mix them all up. And, you know, you really can't, you can barely tell the difference, but it looks really cool, just kind of mixed. But those do, to get strong production, uh, you do want to have cross-pollinators. But all the vacciniums will cross-pollinate themselves. 
too. So that, you know, just having, you know, if you have um, Sparkleberry and uh, Darawai in the same yard, you know, that's cross-pollination enough. But the birds are going to get to those first. <laughs> um, we had a question about the staghorn sumac. So um, where's the best environment for them to thrive? Um, are they okay in partial sun? Um, they're not going to give you nearly the benefits. Um, they're not going to fruit as well. They're not going to um, give you that strong color. And they're frankly just going to be kind of straggly looking, weedy looking things in the shade. Um, so I would say like bright, wide open fields. I mean, that's where you see them the most. That's where they really stand out in the, on the roadsides. Uh, cleared cleared uh, fields or, or kind of reclaimed pastures. Um, and that's one that I'm, I'm experimenting with in my front yard along my driveway, but it does want to spread. There are a couple of cultivars. Um, tiger's eye is a really cool one that stays a lot smaller. And you can actually see that one along the uh, roundabout at the, at the at state botanical garden, um, near the children's garden, that roundabout area, um, at the base of the visitor center, there is some tiger's eye staghorn sumac planted there with a uh, leery op underneath it and it's a really cool look there that one is a cultivar that i would recommend um there's also a uh, fragrant sumac uh, rus aromatica um called grow low that's really more of a ground cover um and it's uh, slightly different doesn't have quite the same compound leaf it looks a lot more like poison ivy but it's not toxic at all and uh, does have a really fragrant leaf and and berries and good fall color. So I would sit, definitely gravitate more towards cultivars of sumac unless you have property. If you got enough land, like plant that uh, staghorn on the net on the edge and just let it go, and it'll it's going to create a huge colony. It's and it's going to look beautiful in the fall and create a uh, tremendous habitat and be a great food source for birds, butterflies. Uh, Tremendous amount of pollinators gravitate towards it. Awesome. Well, you need right. to <laughs> We're at 7.30. I mean, we should have booked you for like three hours. Um, I don't know about everybody, but I am already like daydreaming. Where can I put all these different plants in my current landscape? Um, before everybody signs off, I just want to remind you guys about the evaluation. Uh, we'll send that out in the follow-up email. Also, um, if you want to make sure that you're up to date on classes and things like these, uh, shoot us an email and we can sign you up for the Shades of Green newsletter. If you're not already a member, we only send out the newsletter. It's just once a month. You won't just be getting a bunch of stuff, but it's a great way to um, keep tabs on what's going on in these programs. And then we take a break in December for planning and looking at all those evaluations and figuring out the next year, but just be on the lookout for these monthly classes. Uh, we love having y'all in here, and um, we love listening to all of our Master Gardener speakers. So um, we'll let Alan go, and thanks again. That was an awesome presentation. We'll definitely try to get you back if you're willing. Um, Absolutely. And uh, yeah, everybody have a great Please Contact me if you have any more questions. <laughs> we'll do, and I'll stay on for a little bit longer. If y'all just did not get an itching question um, or have any questions about anything else, I'll stay on for a couple more minutes and monitor the chat. But Alan, thanks so much, and uh, I'll thanks. see you soon. All right. Thanks, Alan. That was great. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>